I thought I would top off our little recursion topic here and just show you two or three little recursive routines that I coded in that I think if you take a look at close enough, uh, you'll be able to sort of understand and make a little sense of. The first one's something called Fractal Frame. These three projects here are actually in your recursion project folder. So if you want to pop them open, you can go take a peek yourself. So what does Fractal Frame do? Well, it's a frame. And when the frame loads up, it calls Paint. Paint does one command, basically. Draw a square. So I tell it the X, the Y position, and the size of a square, and a starting color. Now what does that do? Well, it pops here to the method draw square. Now you can see there's my X, Y, size, and color. Now this recursive method, because you'll see here there's four draw square methods inside of draw square. So yeah, that's right. Every single time draw square is called, four more draw squares are called to draw four more squares. You'll see here what's the difference though between these four squares and the original square is I asked this base case of if the size is bigger than four, divide the size in half. So what's going to happen here is I draw one square, the next four squares that are drawn all have a size half of the square that made it draw. And you'll also see the position where I draw it, I plus and minus, this is just a clever way to draw the new squares at the corner of the original square. Either way, you can sort of peek at it, but here's the overall result. Keeping in mind that every square is told to draw another square in each of its corners until the size goes underneath four. And here's the overall result. And this is basically a fractal pattern. And if you actually look at the order that it's drawing this, it's actually following those instructions. Now this one would probably be too long for you to do on paper like we did our samples, but it is following the rule. It favors the upper left corner, then it favors the upper right corner, then it favors the lower right corner, and then the lower left corner. And that pattern just keeps on going and going until the size goes under four. And that's when it comes out of recursion and gets to do the next square in the list in that recursive pathway. Sort of neat. You can uh, change the delay time there if you want to see it running slower. Another one we wanted to show you was this one here, Gritter Flood Fill. I've taken that Gritter program that you guys have previously used and all I've done here is I've added a button, Toggle Flood Fill. And let's just sort of show you what it does. Toggle in the Flood Fill. So I turn it on, Flood Fill 1. If I turn it off, now it's off. What I want to do is I want to turn it off, and I want to draw in white, and you want to draw an enclosed area. And when you draw your enclosed area, now all you do is you turn flood fill on, so flood is one, and now when I click, it's going to run a method for me called flood fill, which you've all seen before in Paint and Photoshop programs. Click, and it's running a recursive algorithm that basically continues to fill in and flood fill the whole enclosed area. Now if you open the area up, it's going to flood fill the entire screen, right? I have to have an enclosed object here. And you actually will get out of bounds errors. I'm assuming with my code that you're clicking inside an actual closed sealed object. Pretty good, huh? And you can see it works no matter what you draw. Click. Pretty good. Okay, that's flood fill. How does this code work? Well, let's go take a peek at it. Flood fill is fairly easy. It's actually probably easier than that one I just showed you there. But here's flood fill. And flood fill has a nice, simple logic. So I'm told to flood fill a certain column and row, right? One square in my grid. I ask if that square is zero, I turn it white. Okay, so I'm going to color that square white. I draw, so I see this change. I do a little delay in time, just so you can actually see this happening. And then, here's the magic. I say run flood fill again the row above me, and then when you finish doing that flood fill, you can do flood fill on the square below me, the square to the right of me, and the square to the left of me. And now what this actually ends up doing, well, 
if I'm a square and then I tell the four squares around me to all call flood fill, they'll call the same code saying, hey, if I'm black, turn me white. Now remember, if it hits a square that is already white, well, this if statement doesn't run and none of this runs and that's where the recursion ends. So that's why when it hits a white square, there's no more recursion. But if you actually follow the pattern and what this is doing, this is burying itself quite deep in recursion, right? Because a square calls flood fill. This flood fill has to finish all its flood fills that it's going to call before you can do this flood fill. And then that one goes and does all the flood fills. And it keeps going on and on and on. There's other ways to do flood fill, but that's sort of a nice way to show you. If you were to code that with a while loop or a for loop, that would take a lot more work, right? The logic here, especially if I take out the delay code, you know, if I take out the delay code and run that again, that's a very short little code routine. Very logical, makes sense, easy to code. And when I run it, you can see here, I just do my flood fill on and click. Oh, I must still have a little delay there with the draw command. But you'll see there, it'll actually go lightning fast if... I take out that draw, right? Don't do the draw while you're doing it. Maybe do the draw underneath down here. It'll be bam, just like Photoshop or Microsoft Paint does. Third one I want to show you, binary search, recursive. Now you coded binary search with your while loop, most likely. Just want to show you binary search here. Here's an array. And I call binary search recursive. But look at how I call it. I give it the array A. I give it a starting point in the array, slot 0, because I want to start searching from there. I give it an end point in the array, search up to here. Basically what you're doing is, if you remember your binary search, this is low and this is high. Remember you originally set those to the very ends of the array to start off your search. And then another parameter here is, what am I looking for? So let me change that one to 22. So you can see I do have a 22 there. And then it should send me back the position. But this one's done recursively. So check this out. No loop. If end is less than start, so this is like your low and high that you coded before, then we know that we haven't found our item, return negative 1. Otherwise, find the middle and do basically the same stuff you did before, but look at how they get the loop going here. They call return binary search recursive, and they call the method again. But look at this. You give it A, start, and middle minus 1. Middle minus 1 is what you would have switched the high pointer to, right? Remember how you went high equals middle minus 1. And so it comes back up, does it again, checks. Have the pointers crossed yet? If so, negative 1. Otherwise, find the middle, see if my value is at the middle, and if so, return middle. Well, this just keeps cycling and cycling, either until the base case is hit, or until you find your item. So it's just sort of a neat idea there to show you how you can do it. Now, this being said, I would just use the while loop, right? I think sometimes with recursion, it's more for people to show off that they know how to do a little recursion. Um, most people, if you go read about it online, pros and cons of recursion, you're going to find a lot of cons uh, to doing the recursion, especially if your list was huge. Okay, huge list. The recursion could go, you know, on and on quite a few times. Uh, some things like fractal frame obviously makes it very easy to do that solution. And especially some like flood fill. Super simple to code that solution. And you know what? A grid of pixels or squares, it's never going to be too huge, right? It's not going to be like trillions and trillions. So you're not worried about recursion going so deep you get the stack overflow or anything. So, you know, for some solutions, it's nice and simple. For other ones, it's just sort of showing off. Anyways, those are three sort of practical examples there of recursion in action.